All right, I see the Zoom room is starting to fill up. Go ahead and let us know who you are and where you're from and your Penn State class year. We are excited for this next edition of the virtual speaker series. We'll be talking with head women's soccer coach Erica Dombach in just a couple minutes. Again, as always, this is a continuation of our virtual speaker and virtual events that we are offering through the Penn State Alumni Association. You can find all of those events on our website at alumni.psu.edu. We'll be getting started in just a couple minutes. Welcome to the virtual speaker series. Uh, it's good to see Elaine Miller's name in the attendee list. Elaine, hope you are doing well. I guess I should say Graham, I hope you're doing well. Always great to see your name. Let's see Gwen Niece. Thank you all for joining. We'll be getting started in just a minute or two. Let us know where you're zooming in from today. Pedro Alonso from Spain. So if it's uh, if it's 12.02 here, it's probably, what, five in the afternoon there? Is that about right? Thanks for joining us. Sean Latta from New York City. We are hoping to be welcoming a Facebook Live audience as well, uh, having trouble launching that there. Uh, but we will be welcoming those folks in in just a minute. But we are going to go ahead and get started. Where else would you rather be than a Zoom full of Penn Staters? Good afternoon and thank you for joining us. I'm Paul Clifford, CEO of the Penn State Alumni Association. Welcome to, the, to today's virtual speaker session. This session is being recorded so we can share it with other Penn Staters afterwards. Live closed captions are available for this event. You can access them by clicking the closed caption button at the bottom of your Zoom video window and then clicking show subtitle. You can also customize your caption view by clicking the stream text link that is posted in the chat. We are streaming live today's presentation and this live stream has been made possible through the gracious support of a donor and the fund for access, ideas, and audacious goals. Today's presentation will be archived and available on our website after the event. I'm so excited about this afternoon's, uh, this afternoon's speaker. We welcome Erica Dombach, a national champion head coach of the Penn State women's soccer team. Coach Dombach's success is nearly unmatched. She has accumulated 259 wins, holds a 706 winning percentage in 17 seasons as our head coach. She is a two-time National Coach of the Year, four-time Big Ten Coach of the Year, uh, and Coach Dombach has led her teams to 16 NCAA tournaments, 10 Big Ten titles, four Big Ten tournament titles, and the 2015 NCAA National Championship. She will share her perspective on the women's soccer program, how the team is responding to COVID-19 and the outlook for the 2020 and 2021 season. She's entering her 14th season as the head coach of Penn State women's soccer. Prior to coming to Penn State, she earned a bachelor's of science degree in biology from William & Mary, a master's degree in business administration from Lehigh, 
Uh, she is a Huntington Valley, Pennsylvania native. Um, and she also holds uh, NSCAA advanced national degree and a USSFA coaching license. Erica lives here in State College with her husband, Jason, and their two daughters, Addie and Kylie. Please welcome to the virtual speaker series, Coach Erica Dombach. Erica, welcome. Thank you, Paul. It's great to be on this afternoon. And thank you to all of you for joining us. And I know that uh, everybody's lives are pretty full of Zoom right now. So I appreciate that you've jumped on and I'm looking forward to the opportunity to talk about this program um, and talk about these very special players I'm working with right now. Um, Paul, should I just go ahead and start sharing? Yeah, go ahead. Perfect. Driving. Excellent. All right. So welcome everybody. Um, Pedro, welcome from Spain. It was nice to hear you've joined us. Elaine, I would be disappointed if I hadn't heard your name as long as well as Gwen and Sean. Um, love to hear uh, the support that this program continues to have. Um, as Paul said, I am entering my 14th season here at Penn State. Um, and I wanted to start off with just briefly introducing um, you to what we are all about in our program, who we are, uh, what we strive to be. And one of the most interesting part of this COVID time for the women's soccer program is that in 2014, we developed these pillars of success that we wanted to build our program around, have as our foundation, and talk a lot about having this as our, our foundation in the good times and in the tough times. And obviously there's been no tougher times than what we've experienced over these last months. And so to start out with, it is so important for me just to talk about who we are. These three pillars are, um, it came out of conversations with our, with our players. You can read here, the three are attitude of a champion, blue collar and united family. And as this graphic sits, you can see that uh, the words are just words on a sheet of paper until you make that a living, breathing part of who you are. And COVID has challenged these three pillars in all of us, coaches, administrators, um, alumni association, all of us. These words are so much more challenging to live out in these tough times. This idea of attitude of a champion is being the best version of yourself and making good choices every day um, for Penn Staters, for all of us. It's wearing a mask, it's washing our hands, it's being safe. Blue collar is this idea of just rolling up our sleeves and in this COVID time, just the toughest of times, rolling those sleeves up, helping that person next to you um, and, uh, and really just getting to work, even if work involves a Zoom call is sitting in, in an awkward space in your house or uh, you know, a, a space that's not ideal, but you still get the work done. But most importantly, United Family. And United Family is, is one of the reasons why it has been such a challenging time for our program in particular, because we take great pride in recruiting young women of such uh, character and strength in their own mind um, that come together and are so united. And now we've asked them to separate themselves, to not go in each other's homes, to wear a mask when they're in each other's presence, to, um, to not high five, to, to, to not do all the things that a team does. And to be very honest with you, I find that the United Family Pillar has been the one that has been challenged the most because the restrictions have created this environment that doesn't necessarily uh, lend itself to creating a United Family, which only means that we've had to work harder, that we've had to be more creative, that we've had to find ways to be your, more united in ways that, that we've never thought about in the past. So that, that's where I just wanna make sure everybody understands where we're coming from. And then as Paul indicated, um, talked a little bit about the history of the program. The history of this program is one that we're all very, very proud of. Um, we have uh, Sean Lada has joined us. Sean was uh, a part of the club team at Penn State back before it turned varsity in 1994. And Sean and her teammates, just an incredible group of women that I've had the great fortune to get to know over the years um, due to their uh, commitment to this university, commitment to this program and letting me in the door and helping me to understand how hard these women fought to make Penn State a varsity program. Um, them and their, they, they, these teammates paved the way for 
um, the, this list of accomplishments and accolades that you see on this screen, including the 2015 National Championship. We've recently celebrated our 25th year as a program. And as you can see, it has been the premier program um, in the Big Ten and also uh, you know, one of the top five programs in the, in the United States year in and year out. And we are extremely proud of these accomplishments. I would remiss if I didn't say that these accomplishments have come just in, in so many ways through this staff that I've been able to put together, my associate head coach, Ann Cook, my assistant coach, Tim Wassel, um, Carol Lowry, who deals with all of our direct, and I've, I've been able to keep this staff together for many, many years. Anne's been with me for all 14. Tim has been with me for the hall as well. And these accolades are very much a product of their hard work and their dedication. And I feel that our program feels the connection that our staff has. We love to work together. Again, another thing which has made this COVID time has made so challenging is we can't be in the office. We can't have some of those, those laughs and some of the things that coaching brings out the best in all of us. So we've had to be creative and find different ways to do, do so. When you look at our objectives for the fall of 2020, obviously these objectives have changed since um, that date in August when we found out our season was gonna be postponed. Um, obviously, it was a hugely disappointing day for all of us, while at the same time, certainly understanding that the health and well-being of the student athletes in the Big Ten is, is the highest priority and supporting this decision. Um, we took a little bit of time at that point, as you would all understand. Uh, and then when these players came back, they got to work. And I, I can't say enough about what they've done in this period of time to um, to really work at their craft, to work at their trade. I think it took a little bit of time, as you would expect, for an 18 to 22-year-old, some of which are destined to go on and play pro and play for national teams, others that have just chosen to play at the highest level and be the best version of themselves. They're all here for a little bit different reason, but what we've asked them to do as people, players, and teammates is to really embrace the opportunity to work on your craft to take this time to build your house. Um, it, it's just not very often that we have time to really spend honing your craft and, and becoming that best version of yourself as a player and a person. And, um, and these guys have, have done a really nice job of embracing this opportunity. And it hasn't come without huge challenges and ups and downs. But if I look at the trajectory of it all throughout each member of this team, I, I am so impressed with the work that they've put in. I wanted to highlight just a couple of areas. Uh, I, I look at the objectives for this team as kind of the player, the person, and the teammate or the team. And I think for the players, we wanted to develop and train uh, an individual development plan for each player. And you'll see on the calendar that I'm about to put up that these IDP sessions right now are, um, we are working in two week blocks. Every Monday and Friday, we work on the IDP in week one. In week two on Mondays, we train the IDP. And on Fridays, we play an 11 aside match. So really developing and working on creating this program that our players understand what they need to work on so that when they go out to the field, they can get to work, they can be efficient and effective um, and really feel like they've walked away from the training field having accomplished something that day. And then competing to win, this idea of iron sharpens iron. One of the things we talk about in the recruiting process is our push is to make training the hardest part of their week in that they make each other better. The best players they play with and against are going to be on their training field. So come match day, they felt that environment. And that's why I feel like we can be really successful during that time. This time is because we do have 24 players that are committed, that are driving, that are pushing to make each other better. And so, yes, we would prefer to have somebody on the other side of the field on a Friday night under the lights with fans in the stadium. But if we can create that type of environment on the training field, we know these players will grow and get better and continue to improve in the ways that we, we hope they would and to help them to achieve their goals. And then finally for the player, there's a couple other things in here, but I wanted to highlight, we are working on building up a fitness base. Fitness base is something that it takes time. Um, it's a year round calendar. Our our coach, our, our performance coach, Sam Carter, has put together a year round um, training calendar that will allow them to peak come spring season, which is our projected time that we will begin to compete again. 
Moving on to the second set of objectives for the person. Um, you can see here, we've talked about embracing the opportunity to work on your craft, but number two is the one that I really wanna bring out in these guys. I want them to love the game the way they did when they were a kid. We want them to play with joy. We want them to come out there and we want them to be excited about the ball and excited about working and getting better. Um, and, and again, pushing themselves to be the best version of themselves. There's the, the piece about um, having a strong performance in the classroom. I did not highlight that one only because this team last year had a 3.7 average team GPA. So within this program, that has become such a constant and consistent message um, that that's something we feel like just uh, revolves around itself. It evolves as time goes on because the upperclassmen work so well with the younger players to help with that, that classroom piece. And, um, and then obviously, um, with everything that has grown across our country with George Floyd, we want to educate ourselves and engage in conversations surrounding social justice issues and then take action. And I think that that second part is the one that we're still working on as a program. Um, I think the first part obviously is so important and we wanted to make sure that we didn't step right into action immediately without really taking that time to educate ourselves, to engage our alums, to engage our community, to, to make sure that we are in a place in our own minds where we know where we stood and that we could help each other grow and then um, to take action as a team. And, and that's those are the stages that we're in right now. The, for the personal standpoint, the next part would be just to take advantage of resources to focus on our mental health. And that's not just theirs, that's the coaching staff, that's the support staff as well. Penn State's done a wonderful job with the CAPS program in providing these resources. But as you can imagine for student athletes that are the best in the world, asking for help reaching out using resources is an enormous challenge. We have tried to create an environment where Asking, your, asking for help using these resources is a sign of strength. I talk about it as a leader all the time, how important these resources are for me and how I believe strongly that we all need that support in good times and in, in tough times and to really help them to find their way to these resources that I think Penn State, again, has done a nice job in, in, in providing. And then finally, making sure that they are all registered to vote and that that actually takes place and happens and that they're educated not only on the national scene, but all on the local scene as well. So those objectives have obviously uh, grown and evolved during this COVID time. And then the third area would be as a teammate. Um, the first one I'll hit is just lifting up our captains and our leaders and support them as they try to navigate this time. This has been a challenging time um, for the captains and for the leaders and also for the followers. Um, you know, I think the simple idea of college kids, all of us in wearing masks and trying to enforce those areas with people with different philosophies, we're trying to make it be, make the idea as this isn't a philosophy, there's no religion, there's no politics involved. It's all about safety. And I think our captains and our leaders and our team in general have, have really been working to make sure that they're creating a safer environment in our community. And then um, final two things, making training the best part of your day. I think that's an easy one to understand. Show up and work hard and um, make sure that you are bringing the people around you along with you. And from that standpoint, the final one would be this idea of hit your wagon to positive people. Right now you have a choice. We all have a choice every day when we wake up, how our, what our messaging is gonna to be to ourselves and to others. It's very easy to take a negative approach right now, but why? There's, in my opinion, um, you know, the, the best way to go about this right now is to surround yourself with positive people, positive messaging, what you read, what you look at, be careful with your social media and make sure that you hit your wagon to people that are gonna give you positive messaging to make these days better. So those are our objectives for this fall. Just a quick glance at this training calendar. This is just kind of a, um, an overview of what our weeks, I get this question a lot. What are, you, what are you doing right now if you're not in season? Um, the answer to that question is they're working their tails off. We're out on the field. Um, Monday through Friday, we do have some a, a few off Wednesdays in there as well. Um, but they are, as I said, these IDP sessions are on Mondays. They're lifting a couple days a week. We're training. We have 11 v 11 matches on uh, every other Friday, blue white matches um, that we're engaging in. 
and uh, and we are really making some good progress as a team. As I said, we are um, training in two week blocks with certain concepts in these two weeks. So we're trying to to really take this in bite sized chunks, take it day by day, embrace the day, um, really go after the day and work to get to that next 11 v 11, see what we've accomplished during that time, watch video, evaluate our progress, and then start on a new topic while we still continue to build on the old topic. So those are our, that is our overview of our training calendar as it stands right now. We will be going to um, the, the Thanksgiving break as the rest of the students are, and then we'll be departing campus. And at that point, we are probably, um, a week or two away from getting our schedule for the Big Ten for this spring season, upcoming spring season, and our match schedule. And at that point, the calendar will be determined for what it looks like in January, February, and leading up to that Big Ten season. But obviously, we are anxious to get back on the field. We're anxious to get some fans back in the stands. We're excited for football to kick off this, this weekend and to see Penn State Athletics coming back. And we're excited to be a part of it. Uh, but in the meantime, again, just really trying to take it day by day and really work on our craft personally. The outlook for the 2021 fall spring season, um, as you can see on the, le the left here, our captains are Sam Coffey, Frankie Tagliaferri, and Carrie Abello. For those of you that have been around the program, these are three big names across the country, all future pros, all, you know, all three have chance to be on the national team someday if they choose. Um, Kerry is also a, a member of the Schreier Honors College 4.0 student, danced in Thon. Um, these are very, very impressive young women. Um, we have a, a wonderful leadership board that includes Ali Schlegel and Shay Moyer, Kristen Schnur as well. This is a, a very experienced team and a very talented and deep team. So many of these concepts that we're working on right now, all all are surrounded by the fact that going into this spring season, we feel like we'll be very deep, we'll be fit and we'll be talented and we'll be able to really go after teams and really try to um, take advantage of the training we've put in to really punish the Big Ten going into this spring season. Um, we've had a, we've got not, we have nine new players. You see a picture there of Ava and Maria. These are two international students who have come in and, and brought some international flair to our team, have both performed very well. Um, Ava certainly had been an, a standout performer, um, but nine very talented additions uh, into this group that is already, um, again, it's very experienced, a lot of talent in this upperclassmen and are also doing a good job of kind of showing the way of how to navigate this time as well. So um, we're optimistic for this spring. We are thrilled that the NCA has decided to have a championship season segment this spring for women's soccer. Um, and we certainly are working hard now to make sure that we're a part and to do everything we can to be a part of that championship season come, come next spring. I wanna kind of change gears a little bit and just talk about just a day in the life of a Penn State soccer player. Um, because I think, you know, we often receive questions about the Jeffrey Field complex and facility. And I think before I go into that, I just wanna make sure that people are aware of um, what some of the strengths are and why Penn State is a destination for some of the best players in the world. Um, but with that in mind, how it can be even better and how it can be the destination, because I do believe that we have that potential. Um, as you can see here with a look on this campus, right now we have our training field and our match field over at Jeffrey. Um, you know, they've got some different, obviously, parking constraints as all every student does. So that's no different than all other students. Um, we are very um, fortunate to be able to use Holuba uh, and to use that through all of athletics with that indoor training facility. Our, our uh, weight room is over at East Area, which is over by Holuba as well. We've got our academic center in that space as well. And then in Rec Hall houses our coaches' offices, our locker rooms, and our training rooms, which presents obviously a bit of a challenge um, in just the daily logistics for these student athletes. So if you look at kind of the layout of the campus, you all have been here, you know the feeling of the distance between Rec Hall and Beaver Stadium being just over a mile. Um, you know, and those are, those are some of the challenges that, that our student athletes and our soccer players face. If you look at our current situation, as you can see on the left there, 
this match field, these training fields, our grade A surfaces, our grounds crew, Herb Combs and his crew do a phenomenal job. Um, I can't ask any more COVID or good times, whatever the time, they are a consistent force. Um, they are taking care of these surfaces. They are creating uh, an, an environment for these these players to come and train and to and to really improve through their hard work. Um, so our priorities are for the future is just to be a place where our student athletes can can prepare and excel on the field, um, and and to have it as a as a one stop area. So our desire with this next phase, which we are working on the plans, which we have the plans, we're refining these plans. But the obvious one right now, for those that have been to Jeffrey, the, the restrooms need to be sorted. That's a that's an area that is long overdue, to be honest. And as far as fan amenities are concerned, that piece has to be sorted um, as soon as possible. And then the idea with this Jeffrey Stadium project is that we get everything under one roof, that these student athletes can come and they can really prepare and excel uh, and, and become the best version of themselves. And so uh, having their weight room, their training room, the equipment room, the team meeting spaces, the medical spaces, these are all areas that they have available to them on this campus. Um, but in order to really maximize the amount of time they have in a day in order to continue to support their academics and, and to do the things that they need to be doing, it, it is way more ideal, obviously, to have it under one roof. So those are our priorities. Um, our goal is to make Penn State the best place in the country to play college soccer by providing a world-class education and a world-class athletic experience. Again, I believe that Penn State is a destination for these student athletes, the best student athletes around the world. Um, but I, I believe that it can be the destination um, with some work and uh, hard work from this coaching staff and these players. And in order to achieve this goal, we're going to need the help of our alums. And this is the most powerful alumni association in the world. Obviously, this facility project is a big one and needs resources. But we believe that it will have a massive impact on the lives of these student athletes. And we'll take this men's and women's soccer program um, to the continue to stay at that upper echelon and continue to push for more national championships, which obviously is, is our overall goal as well. And with that, I'll just finish off with these pillars where I started because that is our foundation. That's who we are. And frankly, that's something that's hanging in front of me every day in my home office that I have to look at and make sure that I stay true to with all of my decisions. And uh, I feel very honored and privileged to be able to live by these pillars that have been created by this staff and have been refined by these players each and every year to become a living, breathing part of who we are. So with that, Paul, I think uh, I will stop my screen share if I can. All right. If you have questions for Coach Dombach, you can put them in the Q&A uh, tab down on the bottom of your Zoom screen or put them in the comments on Facebook Live. Uh, I, have, I have a ton of questions that I, that I want to get to. Uh, first, I'm, I'm really struck by, and this is nothing new for you, but some people might be hearing you speak for the first time. Your focus is always like 100% on other people, on your teammates, on your coaches, on your, uh, on your players. Um, let's talk a little bit about you, because COVID-19 has certainly had an impact on, on you and your summer plans. You were headed to the Olympics this summer. Talk a little bit about... Um, about how you're dealing with, with that, what, what are the plans for the Olympics and what is your national um, coaching team, your national team coaching gig look like? Sure, thanks Paul. Yeah. You make me talk about myself, aren't you? I see. Yeah. I, see what I have a couple there. others too, so <laughs> get ready. Yeah, as you said, um, I, I have been a part of our US women's national team staff now since January. Um, Coach Flacco, uh, brought me in initially uh, just to support him as he was starting as our national team coach. Uh, but we struck up a good friendship and a great working relationship, and I've made uh, and I've stayed with them. They are currently in camp. Um, I am not in camp. I'm with our Penn State team. That is my priority. Um, our next camp is in Holland in November. Uh, right now, um, I am working on plans in, in joining them on that international trip. When we come back to Penn State, we're obviously required to quarantine. So I wouldn't want to leave 
with uh, in a situation where I'd have to quarantine when I come back and miss that time with my own team. So that's why November is more realistic. Um, but sure, disappointing. Obviously, the Olympics were a huge disappointment. Um, but at the same time, as you as you said before, I have a two and a four year old, Addie and Kylie, right. and this summer afforded me all sorts of time in ways that I could never have dreamed of to to really spend time with my girls. To, to get to know them even a little bit better. Life was, life is crazy as a coach. Uh, and um, I am, I feel just uh, I, I blessed to have that time with them. As far as what the future holds with the national team, um, we're just kind of taking it month by, by month right now. Some of it will depend on what it looks like for the spring season. Um, some of it will look like if, if the, if the Olympics actually are pulled off in, in the future. So um, I've not had to commit to anything at this point. So you and I have talked, and I've heard you speak in front of uh, in front of groups before, um, and I and and I think this is pressure that you put on yourself. I've said this to you before, but your office is in a hallway with uh, with Kale Sanderson, with Russ Rose, um, and and you have created this Hall of Champions kind of, I would call it a little bit of a complex, but it's something that I think you use to drive you as a coach, right? In in comparing. Um, yourself to some of the the other coaches that you share a hallway with so walk just tell the hall of champions story um that that i know you've shared a couple other times sure so it, when you walk into rec hall for those that don't know it's the house of men's and women's volleyball so mark pavlik and russ rose um men's and women's soccer coach cook uh, and um and and kale sanderson and to get to my office i have to pass by uh, many of those doors and many of those trophies and many of those banners. And uh, it, is a, it is a huge responsibility. It's a huge honor, as I said before, but I, I try to open those doors and I try to walk in those doors and, and learn as much as I can. I remember um, Russ in particular, having some really powerful conversations with him when we've gotten really close to winning championships or our team cultures at a point and I'll, I'll step in his office. And he talked about how many years it took him to get over that hump to win that national championship and then how much harder it is to win that second national championship. Um, and, I, and I'll tell you, what's even more powerful are the athletes that are walking around Rec Hall. And, and you see these athletes and you know the commitment and you feel it in the training room. It, again, I go back to iron sharpens iron. You know, I think you've got these in the training room, you've got these women volleyball players, these wrestlers and these women soccer players that just on your daily interactions are learning more and more about how to be successful athletes. And on more than one occasion, I have had an athlete come to my office and say, hey, I was talking to a wrestler and they're doing this. I think this could be really cool for us. And I love that. I love that idea. Yeah. So, um, so this summer, uh, not only have we been dealing with the, the spring into the summer, not only have we been dealing with COVID-19, uh, but we've also been dealing with uh, the continuation of social uh, injustice around our country. And I know some of your, your current team members and some of your uh, past team members have been really outspoken um, around social justice issues. What kind of coaching are you giving them behind the scenes on, on um, how, they can, how they can speak out in really powerful ways and how they can use this platform that they have, not just to play soccer, but really to impact other people? Yeah, so, so your last comment there about using this platform, that's something we've encouraged them to do. It's something that I think is obviously so very important. We want them to uh, make sure their voices are being heard, make sure that they are, there is a call to action individually and collectively. Um, we have been working with a, a gentleman by the name of Kilo Zamora out of Utah uh, that has wor been working with our coaching staff in helping us to facilitate conversations and is also working with us to put an agenda and a curriculum together for our team moving forward. Um, and part of that honestly involves a little bit of conversation about these pillars that I feel so strongly about and where does um, where does the, where do these ideas play into these pillars and how do they intertwine with who we are and our fabric of who we are in our recruiting and our alumni relations in everything that we do. Um, and so again, I, I do feel like it, it, it is and has been important to get our own house in order 
and to make sure we know who we are. And so there's been many discussions. There's been many speakers. We've teamed up with the women's basketball team. Um, we've attended the marches. We've attended the rallies. And right now in our blue and white matches, we're reading our statement before the game and we're asking them to really have their own opinions. And I think that's a little bit what college is about as well, right? Is creating your own opinions, not what your mom or your dad or your grandfather feels about this time, but what do you feel and what are you, what's important to you? What do you hold close to your heart? And, and how do you, how do you want to get that out there? And, and those are the conversations we're engaged in right now. Yeah. So it was great to see in your presentation, the schedule that you put up on the screen. Um, it shows that you're, you know, you're preparing, you're, you're continuing to coach, but it also provides some routine for the student athletes, right? Some sense of normalcy, if you will, with everything that's going on, that's different, right? That, that routine and that normalcy brings some consistency to their week. Uh, but I know that that has been thrown off, right? Coaches like to plan out their year and have everything scheduled and they know when their training season is and when their competition season is and when recruiting is. How has this schedule, um, this shift in schedule with the potential spring season really thrown off uh, recruiting or adjust, forced you to adjust recruiting schedules uh, when, uh, when your student athletes who may be thinking about going pro when their pro seasons might start and what potential conflicts might be there? Talk a little bit about how COVID-19 and shifting to the spring has adjusted your schedule. Sure. So, you know, on that, that last slide I talked about with the, the teammate and hitching your wagon to positive people, that is certainly the way that I live my life and, and try to really take a positive approach. But as you indicated, I would say every day of this year has been harder than this same day last year right? And kind of comparing it, right? And so all of these different areas, um, the more I've read, the more I've taken it in and understanding the more type A, the more structured, the more put together you are, almost the harder this time is, right? Because you are so used to that structure. And I, and I find that with even with our student athletes, those that are that really have things in proper order are having an even harder time, which makes it even harder for them because they can't figure out why they're having such a hard time. Um, and so I think fortunately our recruiting was in a very good place when that, when all of this hit, we had just gone through some recruiting rule changes and we have come out on the other side of it in a very positive way in that we are in a very good place going into that. So we've been able to kind of put a check mark next to the recruiting for a little while. Um, but as far as this training calendar, this two week block thing has been just as important for the coaching staff as it has been for the student athletes. We needed to jump in with both feet on topics that we felt we could accomplish, that we could move forward, that we could get to an end of a certain period of time and go, wow, we feel really good about that time. Or, hey, we need to, we need to put more in right now. And so it, kept, it keeps us in check. It keeps our staff in check and our student athletes in check. It took this two and a half months of training time into two week bite-sized chunks that has become way more manageable. We're actually on a break this week. So we had presented to them as, as three two-week chunks and then a break. And so they're on their break week. And now we come back and we only have two blocks left. And, and that, that has created this intentional way of approaching each week so that there's way more direction and focus. Um, and then we intentionally haven't gotten too much into the spring yet because there still is enough unknown that you don't want to get ahead of yourself. Yeah. So really focusing on the here and now. Yeah, you talked about hitching your wagon to positive people. You've also talked about lifting other people up around you. And I'm going to force you to talk about yourself again. Um, that what is your approach to supporting female coaches to increase the number of female coaches on the collegiate level or just in general? Um, and, and how have you provided those opportunities in your program? Well, I love that question. I love that topic. That topic needs a ton of attention right now. And fortunately, I actually think it's getting more attention than it has in quite a while because there is time for people to sit and think about these things. How do we attract more people? Um, I'm a part of a program with U.S. Soccer, a, a mentor program. In fact, Thursday, I'll be um, assigned my mentee that I'll be working with for the next year. Um, and they're assigning female, young female coaches with, a, with I think there's 30 of us that have been designated as mentors to grab and bring into the game and to really help them feel the energy passion. Um, for me, I take responsibility as a, as a female with a family 
to help young female coaches understand, even with a two and a four year old at 40 plus, that it's still something that if you surround yourself with good people and you have a village, that it is more than just manageable, it's downright fun. Yeah. And that that family makes you a better coach. And that fact that you're a coach makes you a better mom. And that all goes hand in hand. So um, I think that U.S. Soccer has started these mentorship programs, but most importantly, in our own program, we're, we try to um, work with our own players to give them that passion and excitement. They see the way that Ann and I work off each other. We have a couple of players that have told us that, that they're going to take our jobs in a few years. <laughs> hold, hold off a little bit, Maya Hayes and Taylor Schramm, you guys, we have a couple more years here. Um, but I, but I love that. Uh, you know, I love that, that we have so many of our former players that have gone into to coaching and honestly, Paul, I feel that that's a huge part of my legacy and our legacy that Ann and Kara and I have all talked about and that we feel strongly about. Um, and we love these women that are former players of ours. And we're so proud of what they're doing in the game right now. Sandy Barber also talks about preparing our student athletes for a future of impact, right? Go off into the world and whatever you choose to do, uh, make an impact. That's what we're preparing them to do. You have prepared numerous student athletes to go off and actually compete professionally playing soccer. I know Ellie's over in Europe. I know Maddie's in Utah. Talk a little bit about where um, some Penn Staters and the pros are and, and where they're competing. Yeah, again, this is this is a really exciting topic to you're, you're pushing all the right buttons here, Paul, because this gets me all fired up. Yeah. But yeah, we've got recent grads, Ellie Jean and um, Kaylee Real are both over in, in Europe right now. Kaylee just signed for Paris FC. Um, we've got uh, many former players that are in our NWSL Pro League that is growing with each year. Next year, we've got um, another club coming in and, and racing Louisville. Um, and then we've got uh, a team coming out in LA as well. So there'll be more and more opportunities. We've got Ali Krieger and Alyssa Nair that are still competing for our U.S. national team. Um, young players like Elizabeth Ball had a, had a, a standout performance in Utah this year. She really had a big year for them. So to see these players that have been in the league for a couple of years really coming into their own. Uh, Mallory Weber, I, I think that they're well prepared when they came, came out, but then they've gotten into that environment and now they're thriving. Another player I want to mention is Marissa Shiva. She graduated a year ago and she's trying to find her way and she's clawing her way into that Utah club. They picked her up for the challenge cup, but that's a, you know, that's the reality of women's soccer players that are trying to make it pro. They, they're not making any money. They're just doing it for the love of the game. And that goes back to why that's such a huge priority right now for us is during these toughest of times, if you can stay in love with the game, it keeps you going. And that's what we're, that's what we're really trying to create in the program. Yeah. We became big soccer fans uh, when we lived out in the Pacific Northwest and um, we, we were uh, Portland Timber fans, but as part of the package that we bought for Portland Timbers, it also came with Portland Thorns um, tickets as well. And, and what we learned was that MLS is probably fifth or sixth level pro, um, pro conference in the world, right? The, the Women's Soccer League, is the, it's the best women's soccer players in the world playing here in the United States. And we actually enjoyed the Thorns game so much more than the, than the Timbers games. It was so much fun. And there's, there's some flair to the Pacific Northwest and how they approach, how they approach soccer, which, which made it fun. So if you live in a market that has a national women's soccer league team, check it out because those are the best women's soccer players in the world competing right here in the United States. Yeah, we're really proud of the, of, of the product that that league has put out. You know, you, you mentioned Portland and Britt Eckerstrom has become their starting goalkeeper right now and, and had some big time performances this past summer. Raquel Rodriguez is starting in the midfield and she's starting alongside the likes of a Christine Sinclair and a Lindsay Horan. And these are the biggest names in our sport in the world that are playing in these teams. Yeah. So, um, so we really got to know each other traveling on Coach's Caravan. Um, a lot of stories. I'm not going to share. I'm not going to share all of them. I'm only going to share one. <laughs> but I think the story that I'm going to share really personifies um, how each season and each team matters to you. So we would bring the uh, the Big Ten Championship hockey trophy, and uh, we brought the Big Ten Championship football. Uh, trophy and and all these trophies were and and we had the 
most recent Big Ten championship that you had won. And so I carried it off the bus one time and I broke it. I knocked the faceplate off the trophy. And, and you said, hey, be careful with that. that. that That's our trophy. I'm like, you have a dozen of these, right? And you said, yeah, but that one was really hard to win. Each team, each season matters to you. And, and it's like, um, it, it's never kind of resting on the laurels of past success. It's all about the now and the future. Um, so talk a little bit about um, that, that kind of reset button that you hit um, that, that says, okay, last year's over, this year is this year, and winning this next trophy is going to be, if not harder than previous years, uh, if, I mean, as hard, if not harder than previous years. Yeah, I'm, I'm still kind of, I'm still kind of angry for you breaking that trophy. I know that. We'll, yeah, well, we glued it. We glued it back on. You can get me some stickies or something. Um, you know, I think that there's this idea with these successful programs, with Gino, with Russ Rose, with these coaches that have been doing it year after year, that God, they must just get boring or whatever word you want to use, fill in that blank there. But the reality is because you are so connected to these student athletes and because they have such unique and amazing stories, that championship becomes a culmination of the stories of each of those student athletes and how you intertwine and how all of that comes together. So for example, right now we're in the sixth year of Kristen Schnur. Kristen Schnur is a, is a student athlete that has had multiple knee surgeries, that has taken on a graduate degree, that has recently got engaged, that has stayed at Penn State and now is in the middle of a um, a pandemic, but darn if she doesn't get to play this last season. Um, and she's somebody that she actually lived in the freshman dorms this summer to help with our freshmen. I want that championship trophy for Kristen Schnur right now. And, and when I look at each championship trophy, I look at the personalities and the stories and the hardship and the tough times that, you know, we've got Ava and Maria that are here from overseas that left their home countries and have taken a chance on Penn State and, and have come to, to chase their dream of combining world-class academics and athletics. And so each trophy to me symbolizes the story of each of these athletes and how that all intertwines. I believe that each, forget about a book about the program, each year could have its own book. Each game yeah. could have its own chapter because there's so much effort, emotion, and excitement that are wrapped up in each of these players' stories that I that I, I could talk all day. Yeah, I, I worked at UConn for four years. And so I've heard Gino tell the story. You mentioned how Russ told the story of uh, beating Nebraska and getting over, getting over the hump. For Gino, in the early years, it was the University of Virginia was the marquee women's basketball program. And he would always say, you know, winning that first championship and, and climbing the mountain once was, was almost impossible. Staying on top of the mountain is even harder because you're getting everyone else's best shot. Everyone is, is coming for you, right? It's, uh, it's, so it's oftentimes harder to sustain that success over years and to fight becoming complacent to stay at that really high level. And I think, you know, your, your name being mentioned with those other coaches is, is appropriate because you have now done that here at Penn state over the past 13 seasons into your 14th season now. Yeah. And, you know, I think you look at, I think you look at that first one and yes, it, it is the most challenging and you look at trying to sustain it. I, I think this idea of winning the first one, it's like you have to be there to win it. That happened to us in 2012. We went to the national championship. We learned great lessons and then we end up winning it in 15. I think this idea of sustaining this excellence and success you ha is, is a little bit of a learned thing as well because you start with having this huge target on your back and that can become overwhelming early on. And until you get to the point where you can overcome and you see that as a wonderful challenge and privilege to have that target in, uh, on your back, that's when you start to really figure out how to sustain it of give me that target and give me your best game and we'll still beat you. And that's actually the mentality we're trying to work on right now in the off season and, and in this iron sharpens iron mentality training we're trying to do. All right, let's have a little fun. We have a couple minutes left here. I'm going to throw some quick hitter questions at you and want to get your want to get your response. Okay, first, sheets or Wawa? Wawa. All right. Right uh, here. Right here. Look at that. She's got a Wawa cup. 
Wow, that is that is commitment to the brand right there. It's I mean it's Philadelphia. Let's say it. Let's call it. <laughs> um, favorite flavor of creamery ice cream. Uh, let's go with um, I'll go peachy paterno. Okay. Besides um, teams that play at Jeffrey Field, what's your favorite Penn State sport? Basketball. Basketball. Men's and women's. Uh, final question. Tell us your most, um, your most memorable or your most unusual we are story. You're walking through an airport in Nicaragua or, um, right? What, what, is your, what is your we are story where you heard it and you're like, wait, I'm not, I'm not in Happy Valley and I'm hearing this. Yeah, this is, um, this is a little bit um, throwing out some names and some concepts here, but I'll, I'll do it anyway. Of, yeah. Um, a few years ago, I had the opportunity to work with FIFA, which is our, our world governing body of our sport. And I was invited to a conference in Switzerland and Zurich, where our national headquarters are. And, and after that, um, my associate head coach, Ann and I were college teammates and closest friends. And I said, hey, I'm in Zurich. You want to come skiing? Let's go skiing. So uh, she flies over because that's what she does. She's, she's the best. And we, we take a train down to this little town called Zermatt, Switzerland. And uh, we go up and we're having lunch and there's just a table full of Penn Staters in a small town uh, in Zermatt, Switzerland. And I thought, it, it, <laughs> it, 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 we are just everywhere. We're absolutely everywhere. And we gave a good shout on the mountain that day. That's awesome. Erica, your accomplishments continue to swell thy fame of, of dear old state. And for that, we're truly grateful. Thanks for joining us on the virtual speaker series today. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. And everyone else joining us, you can check out more events at alumni.psu.edu. Thanks for all you do for the university, for the glory, and for the future. We are Penn State.